So, welcome back to The Real Crisis in Cosmology. In the first episode of this series, we saw how the Big Bang Theory is contradicted by the evidence of the abundance of light elements. So the question is, is there another explanation that doesn't require a Big Bang for the abundance of the light elements, helium, deuterium, lithium. Well, it turns out that for the past half century, there has been developed an alternative explanation. It's an explanation that I call the galactic origin of light elements, or GO. So, from 1970, it was known that deuterium, the heavier isotope of hydrogen could be produced by cosmic rays by the collision of a proton with another proton producing deuterium and another particle called the pion, which decays rapidly. This was back in 1970. Well, in the middle of the 1980s, several researchers, Adus, Silk, Walker, pointed out that helium is being produced by stars. It had been known since the 1930s that the conversion of hydrogen into helium by thermonuclear fusion reactions in stars was the main source of energy in the universe. So helium could have come from ordinary stars in the galaxy, and deuterium and lithium could have come from cosmic rays. Lithium can be produced by the collision of helium item ions in cosmic rays with helium ions in the background plasma, or by the collisions of protons with carbon or oxygen in the uh, background medium. Well, starting in 1989, I got involved in this development of new theories about the light elements. And mine, which was published in 1989, was the first dynamical model of the formation of galaxies. So what I was asking was, can we, starting from plasma theory, the theory of how uh, currents move through ionized gases, plasmas, where the electrons are stripped off and free to move. From that theory and from laboratory experiments with plasmas, can we establish how a galaxy would form and how the stars within that galaxy would develop and therefore produce light elements? Well, I started from the theoretical uh, premise, which comes from plasma instability theory and from observations that plasmas typically form filaments. They form filaments because the pinch effect draws together currents that are moving in the same direction. And in these filaments, there's a sort of speed limit, a characteristic velocity, which is basically about a thousand kilometers a second, about one three hundredth of the velocity of light. And this indirectly comes from the ratio of the mass of the electron to mass of the ion. So this is equivalent to a temperature of about 6.3 keV, or 70 million degrees. Pretty toasty, because uh, for comparison, the temperature in the center of the sun is about 10 million degrees. So this is the characteristic of these filaments that form in plasmas at any scale. Now, why is this significant for the development and the dynamics of galaxy formation? Well, for a body of plasma to contract under the influence of gravity, it has to be collisional. The particles have to be colliding with each other in approximately the distance they travel to get from one side of the object to the other. If they're not colliding with each other, if they're just moving in orbits, 
then they won't contract. Just like the planets in our solar system don't contract into the sun because they're not colliding with each other. So the rate of collision is dependent on the velocity that the particles are moving. The faster they're moving, the fewer collisions that they encounter. So for a body to be collisional, it turns out that the product of the density n times the radius r has to be more than 10 to the 19th per centimeter squared, 10 to the 19th particles per centimeter squared. To give an idea of what this number means, this would be the surface density approximately of a piece of paper. So actually a, a rather non-astronomical value. Since we know theoretically and from observations what the relationship between density and radius is in a contracting body of plasma, this allows us to calculate the mass of a typical star that forms when the density of a galaxy is at a certain value. So it turns out that the mass of the star in units of the solar mass is approximately 1.8 divided by the square of the density measured in particles per centimeter squared. This is important because this gives us an ability to predict the size of the, of the stars developing at a given point in time and space as a plasma contracts into a galaxy. In the model that I developed in 1989 and published, you can see that uh, this model was developed a long time ago. We were still using Roman numerals. We could predict that stars would develop in certain zones in a contracting galaxy. So the heaviest stars would develop in the least dense zones. And as the galaxy contracted, stars of lesser and lesser mass would develop. Now, it is well known that the bigger the star, the more massive the star, the faster it burns helium. The more helium it produces, the brighter it is, and the shorter its lifetime. So a star that's 12 times as massive as the sun produces energy thousands of times faster than the sun and lives thousands of times shorter, only about 20 million years compared with the lifetime of the sun, which is about 10 billion years. So what we find in this model is that the heaviest stars, those heavier than 12 times the mass of the sun, will form along the plane of the galaxy in a narrow disk. These are the only stars that end their lives as supernova and therefore produce the heavier elements, elements like iron. In the bulk of the galaxy, in the mass of the galaxy, so in zones 3 and 4, stars of intermediate mass between 4 and 10 to 12 times the mass of the sun are being produced. And these are stars that produce helium and small amounts of carbon and oxygen, but no heavier elements, no iron. And finally, in the outermost zone of the galaxy, in uh, zones with Roman numeral 2, you still have the pure unprocessed hydrogen. So this model predicted that over approximately a 200 million year period, these bigger stars, the intermediate mass stars, would produce energy at about a hundred times faster than the sun relative to their mass. So a hundred times the 
light to mass ratio of the sun. They would produce helium much faster so that in this 200 million year period they would produce approximately the 24 percent helium that we observe today. And because they would also be producing far more cosmic rays than stars do today, they would be producing the amount of deuterium we observe today. So this model published back in 1989 predicted the correct amounts of helium and deuterium. Well, time moved on and what happened subsequently? Many of the predictions of this theory, which could not be tested in the late 1980s, became confirmed with better data becoming available in subsequent decades. So the first thing that happened was in the late 1990s, telescopes like the Hubble telescope peering deeper into space were able to detect objects that looked very much like the galaxies in formation that were predicted by this theory. So the first thing was the detection of what are called Eulergs, which are ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. So these galaxies were extremely bright relative to their mass, hundreds of times brighter uh, in terms of luminosity per unit mass than the sun. And these were observed throughout the universe. They, they were obviously actually quite common objects, and they became more common as we looked out into space and back into time. So what we saw was that uh, in this graph, the luminosity of galaxies is plotted in the vertical dimension and their mass in the horizontal, in both cases on logarithmic scales. So what we see is the, that the black line, a diagonal black line at the bottom of the graph shows typical galaxies that are mature, galaxies like our Milky Way today, in which, roughly speaking, there's about as much light per mass as for the sun. So a galaxy with approximately uh, a little less than a trillion times the luminosity of the sun also has approximately a trillion times the mass of the sun. But if you look at these observations of these ultra-luminous galaxies, you see the top diagonal red dashed line that is the line predicted by our model for the youngest galaxies, which have approximately 100 times as much luminosity. So for a mass, for example, of 100 billion, 10 to the 11th times the mass of the sun, they have 10 to the 13th, 10 trillion times the luminosity. You can see that there are quite a few galaxies along that line and many that even exceed that. So this was the first new confirmation in the late 1990s that there really was um, a set of galaxies in formation that could produce these very high luminosities and by necessity those were producing large amounts of helium, approximately 25% of the hydrogen was turned into helium in the lifetime of uh, these forming galaxies. That is, during the part of their life that they were in this intense formation period. Now, there was another implicit uh, prediction in this 1989 theory, which is the number of cosmic rays that were produced by these galaxies in formation, these young galaxies. So, from this prediction of cosmic rays, we could derive a prediction of the number of neutrinos we would observe. Now, I think neutrinos are, are my favorite 
elementary particle and maybe many other people's particle. It's, it's a f fascinating little particle that is able to penetrate matter with almost uh, not even a glance. So uh, neutrinos are very good at social distancing. So neutrinos have to be produced in the collisions of cosmic rays that produce the deuterons. Well, it wasn't until the past decade that we had huge instruments like IceCube that could actually observe the very few interactions these neutrinos had with matter, in, in this case with a uh, mass of ice in the instrument. So what we found was that if you look at the crosses in the right-hand portion of this graph, you see measurements of neutrinos at various energies, and these are very high energy neutrinos. These observations very neatly fit the predictions of the 1989 theory. So the number of cosmic rays that produce these neutrinos must have produced enough deuterium to account for the deuterium that we observe in the universe. The only catch here was that these um, cosmic rays in producing neutrinos should also be producing gamma rays. So gamma rays are photons, electromagnetic radiation, that are also very high energy. Well, for every reaction that produces a neutrino, there should be one and a half gamma rays also produced. Well, we have uh, instruments like Fermi-Lat that observe these high energy gamma rays, almost as high energy as the neutrinos. And if you look at the left-hand part of the diagram, you see that the number of gamma rays, if projected under the neutrino curve, is a lot less. It's about 50 to 100 times less than what you would expect from the neutrinos. So people have noticed this independently of the predictions of my theory and have been asking for about a decade, well, where are these gamma rays? So when I started to look back at this theory to update it, I looked at this problem and I realized that there was a solution. And this solution came in observations of the star that we can observe best, which is the sun. And the observations starting in the 1990, that is just a year after I published my uh, initial theories on this subject, was that most cosmic rays are trapped in the magnetic field of the star that produces them and they travel back down to the surface of the star and collide with the star's material in a downward direction. So observations of our own sun demonstrated that about 99% of cosmic rays are trapped. Now why is this significant? It means that relativistic beaming, a product of the fact that these cosmic rays are traveling close to the speed of light means that most of the gamma rays that they produce also go downwards into the sun or into other stars. And of course that means the gamma rays are not observed. They're absorbed in the bulk of the star. But neutrinos, they don't care whether they're moving up or down. They pass straight through the bulk of a star no problem. So we can observe the neutrinos that are produced by these downward going cosmic rays, but we can't observe the gamma rays. So this 
phenomena observed again starting 30 years ago and confirmed by many observations of our own sun shows that in these starburst galaxies, these galaxies that are forming, they can produce a hundred times more neutrinos than gamma rays because the gamma rays are absorbed in the bulk of the stars. So based on this new uh, improvement, which takes into account the fact that these cosmic rays are going downward into the stars that have generated them, I developed over the last two years a model revision, the goal 2020 revision, to update the 1989 model and compare it again with observations. So the big modification is that these downward going cosmic rays, instead of moving outward into the galaxy, somewhat increases the amount of deuterium and lithium that is produced for each cosmic ray particle. The second modification I made in the model was that the change in the stellar pro properties as the galaxy evolves are made continuous with time instead of being discrete generations of stars as they were in the first model. That's except for the first generation of stars, which is sort of unique because it's formed from pure hydrogen. To make the calculations easier, I assumed a homogeneous model for the galaxy. So we're ignoring the very big stars that produce supernova in the disk. We're just looking at the typical stars that form in the bulk of the galaxy. Also, we're assuming that all stars formed at the same time have identical mass course is not really true. There has to be a distribution of mass. Now, would it be good to put in the, uh, remove these simplifications, of course, but that needs more work and more researchers. So we hope somebody is going to fund this research in the future and get more people involved in it. So from this model, and this is what I pre uh, presented at the American Astronomical Society meeting in January of this year in Hawaii before we all started social distancing. This allows us to show what the time evolution of the light elements will be as a typical galaxy forms. So what we are talking about is the history of a given galaxy, not the history of the universe. All objects in the universe, they have origins in time. Just like you and I were born at a certain time. But that does not imply that the universe itself has an origin in time. These are galaxies, are objects within the universe, and of course they have histories they were born at a certain time. So we're talking about baby galaxies, galaxies that are born in the universe in the past and are still being born today in the present universe. So we see that very early in the history of this galaxy, we see a rapid rise in helium. So that's the first the red curve, rapid rise to a plateau of deuterium, and then a slower rise of carbon, the top blue curve, and boron, which is produced by cosmic rays interacting with carbon, and lithium is intermediate. The reason why we're seeing this rapid rise and then plateauing is because, again, the earliest stars formed at the less, least density are the most massive ones, and those are the ones that produce light elements the fastest because they are producing energy the fastest. So from this theory, we can actually 
develop predictions that compare the observations of stars in our galaxy with the predictions of the theory. So, for example, we've been able to compare the abundance of oxygen and the abundance of helium in stars against the predictions of the theory. So these dots are observations of stars in our galaxy. The red line is the minimum amount of helium that stars should have based on the Big Bang Theory. And you can see that there are hundreds of stars observed, as we pointed out in episode one, that are below this minimum, that contradict the predictions of the Big Bang. But if you look at the blue line, which is the predictions of the goal theory, it actually explains the existence of these low helium stars and is a pretty good fit to the bulk of the stars. Obviously, there's a lot of scatter among the stars, but there's quite a decent fit in contradiction to the Big Bang theory. If we go on to the lithium predictions, we get an even better story. Now, most of the lithium observations compare lithium to iron abundances in the stars. At the moment, our theory is not predicting how much iron they, there is, because that comes from these heavier supernova. But we are predicting how much carbon there is. And there are a number of stars in which both the carbon and the lithium has been observed in the oldest stars with the least of these elements in them. And if we look at the blue dots with their observations, they're quite a good fit to the predictions of the theory, which is the blue line. And again, as I pointed out in episode one, there's a very poor fit to the predictions of the Big Bang theory, which are within the limits of the horizontal red lines. So according to the Big Bang, there should be no stars that have lithium values less than the lower of these red lines. And of course, that's abundantly contradicted. Now finally, we can use the predictions of the production of carbon to predict two other elements, boron and beryllium. These are light elements that it's agreed are produced by the uh, cosmic rays colliding with carbon and oxygen in the background plasma. And for beryllium, for example, we can compare the model's prediction, which is the blue line, with observations of the abundance of beryllium versus the abundance of oxygen in these stars. And again, there is quite a good fit to the uh, observation. So overall, this table compares observations with both the 1989 and the 2020 models of the goal theory. And what we see for deuterium, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron, there's both good agreement between the 1989 and the 2020 models and good agreement of both with observations. So here we have confirmation that this model that says the light elements can be produced by processes that we observe going on in galaxies in the process of formation can explain the observations without any necessity for there being a Big Bang. So what can we conclude from these first two episodes? First of all, the helium and lithium abundance observation, as we pointed out in the first episode, decisively contradict the Big Bang prediction. Second, a galactic model of light elements accurately predicts 
the abundance of helium, deuterium, lithium, carbon, boron, and beryllium. The downward trapping of 99% of cosmic rays, demonstrated by 30 years of solar observations, resolves the missing gamma ray problem. In addition, the certainty that there is galactic production of helium, deuterium, and lithium makes the contradictions of the observations and the Big Bang predictions even worse. That is, if there were a Big Bang, then what we would observe is not only the Big Bang predictions of helium, deuterium, and lithium abundances, which are already too high for observations, we would also have the inevitable production of these elements in the formation of galaxies. So we would have abundances that are even higher compared with observations. Therefore, we have to conclude that the universe could never have undergone an epoch of simultaneous high density and high temperature. Or in simpler terms, the Big Bang never happened. Now, we're going to continue this story in future episodes because we want to look at other bodies of data and compare the Big Bang predictions with observations and then continue to see whether there are other non-Big Bang explanations that fit this data better. So we're going to continue on in the series by looking at phenomena such as large-scale structure, the cosmic microwave background, matter and antimatter in the universe, and the phenomena that the Big Bang tries to explain with dark matter and dark energy. So we've got a, quite a bit of ground more to cover and tune in to the next episode. If you want to support the work we're doing, please subscribe and support the effort to produce these videos. You can subscribe at our website, lppfusion.com. Thanks for your support. Stay safe.